Well, on behalf of the uh, Yahats Academy of Arts and Sciences, thank you for coming. My name is Mark Courtney, and uh, me other members of the Academy are here. Thanks for all of you who helped make the Winter Solstice event so successful this year. How many of you were at the Winter Solstice event? Good, good. Well, it was, it was great. It was great having you, and hard work of members of the Academy uh, made sure it was all set. Everything didn't burn down, it just burned up. So, before I introduce our, our, our speaker today, I want to mention about our next presentation, which is coming up Sunday, February 11th. So, if you can, it's not too early to put it on your calendar, it's 2 p.m. on Sunday, February 11th. It's called Around the World, and it's the most amazing uh, 4K resolution photographs of the travels and the uh, and the special places that the eyes and equipment of our own councilman uh, Greg Scott uh, is going to be presenting to us and having seen some of those you will see you'll see this around town and down in Walport and we'll start to have them all over the place but it is going to be amazing it, Greg was explaining that it's OLED uh, type of photography and light, which means every pixel is a, is a light uh, source. And, and so you're going to see some really amazing high resolution photographs on Sunday, February 11th. So without any further ado, um, we're going to be hearing from the author of two of my favorite books. Uh, one of them is called Beauty from the Beast. And obviously it's not my uh, biography. Uh, that would be Beast from the Beauty. But this is Beauty from the Beast, uh, Clay Tectonics and the Landscapes of the Pacific Northwest. And his latest book is called Oregon's Island in the Sky, Geology Road Guide to Mary's Peak. And he has autographed copies of his books over there for sale. And uh, it's one of the best illustrated books. Beauty from the Beast is like my, one of my favorite coffee table books. Whenever I have people visiting who are worried about the subduction zone or the six extinction or whatever, I just show them this and they're just put at ease, put at rest. So on your way out, take a look at them and, and, and consider getting them. Uh, they make wonderful gifts for people of all ages. I know it because I've been using it for that. Our, our guest is a, a professor emeritus, or emeritus professor of geology from Oregon State University. Um, he, his first book was about the national parks and sort of the landscape and te tectonics of, of our national parks. He's also uh, an inter interpretive person. He's a certified interpretive trainer, and he'll tell you more about that. Uh, he is a, a world traveler. Uh, I call him a Rhodes Scholar, and he'll tell you what that means. And just somebody who is not only passionate about the sciences and, and his area of expertise, but as I think you'll experience, he's passionate about life itself. So without any further ado, our guest and speaker today, Dr. Robert Lilly. Mount Hood, 
and it was outside the total eclipse. So it had this amazing orange glow to it. So it was a very special place <coughs> to see. Take, let's say you know when you want the light. Okay. It was a very special place to see the eclipse because it has such a commanding view of the entire Cascade Volcanic Range to the east and then the Pacific Ocean to the west. Yeah, you want to get the, the lights up. Can you do it so it's not completely dark? Can you dim it a bit? Yeah, there you go. Okay, that's getting better. We'll let Mount Hood come into focus here. It's a, such a pleasure to be here at the Yahats Academy of Sciences. I was telling Mark that I've actually worked at the, a long time ago at the Czechoslovak Academy of Sciences in Prague. So when I heard there was a Yahats Academy of Arts and Sciences, it's, it's amazing, all these academicians here in Yahats. And I'm not surprised, though. Yahats is such, such a unique community. Of course you have an Academy of Arts and Sciences. But it's a real thrill to be here. How many of you were around when this happened? The beast of a volcanic eruption, Mount St. Helens. Yeah, I, most, most people in this room were around. If they weren't around, then their parents or grandparents probably have stories for them about their own ex personal experience. It, so we know there can be beastly, terrifying events that occur here in the Pacific Northwest, but we also know this. Who's been to Crater Lake National Park? Yeah, this is beauty that comes from exactly the same beast. Without those volcanic eruptions, we wouldn't have this incredible landscape. So we need to learn to take the beauty with the beast, I, I like to say. Of course we need to be prepared, be aware and be prepared for earthquakes and volcanic eruptions, but we need to be prepared, not scared. But also, if we appreciate the beauty, we realize, well, okay, you know, this place, yeah, it has its things we might be uh, concerned about, but it also has these wonderful things. And it's here for the same reason. Who was around for this? The last big Cascadian <laughs> survivor <laughs> in 1700. <laughs> I don't know if you're Native American, your ancestors may have told you about it. It may have been passed on. And that's, that's one reason we know so much about this, is because of Native people, that indigenous knowledge is very powerful. So I'll be talking about this later, evidence, these um, ghost forests is evidence for the last big earthquake in the Pacific Northwest. But who's been to Olympic National Park or to Yahats, Oregon? <laughs> I mean, this incredible landscape, if you get tens of thousands of earthquakes over tens of millions of years, this is what you end up with. So again, this is Beauty from the Beast. So the first book Mark was talking about, Beauty from the Beast, Plate Tectonics and the Landscapes of the Pacific Northwest. If I had a, a one sentence to sum this up, it would be this. The same geological forces that threaten our lives with earthquakes and volcanic eruptions also nourish our spirits by forming the spectacular mountains, valleys, and coastlines of the Pacific Northwest. The landscape of Oregon in the Northwest, it's a, it's a fantastic landscape. I think you can all see the landscape of Oregon from where you're sitting, right? And notice that something very prominent here in western Oregon and Washington, there's two parallel mountain ranges. There's the coastal range, and in far, there are 100, 150 miles inland, there's a Cascade Volcanic <coughs> mountain range, something very uh, distinct about <coughs> the Pacific Northwest. So, one question we'll delve into here, why are there these two parallel mountain ranges? And then second, why are there earthquakes, tsunamis, and volcanic eruptions? And I'll give you a hint. It's the same answer. <laughs> we'll get into that. <laughs> but equally important is how do these things relate to us? How do the landscapes and these geological hazards, how do they affect biology, ecology, and human history? And I put this oval here to remind you that this is where like 80% of the population of the Pacific Northwest live, in the Puget Sound, Willamette Valley area, the low region between the two parallel mountain ranges. So these two ranges are very important to us for many reasons. So let's actually look at this one first. And 
as a geologist, you know, I'm fascinated about these things. You know, these are rocks. <laughs> this is most of the rock of Oregon. This is called basalt, yeah. And it's incredible, but I like that. But equally important is what this rock uh, says about us and why this rock is important to us. In other words, what's the connections of us to the physical landscapes, the rocks and the topography and everything that happens on it? What are the connections? So here's one. Puget Sound and Willamette Valley, again, they're the area but near sea level, a little below or a little above sea level, between these two active mountain ranges. And then also, the two ranges, they greatly affect this. We know the climate, the rain shadow effect, the ecology. We know as you change elevation, uh, you change the veg vegetation and habitat. And also the human history, the migration and land use of people. All of these are affected by these two parallel mountain ranges. So I, I do some work for Oregon Master Naturalists. Is, is anyone a master naturalist here or knows about it? Yeah. You're, you're master naturalist? Or you know about it? Okay. Anybody a master gardener? Yeah. Okay, it's a great program. But master naturalist is also through OSU Extension. And you become, if you go through the program, you become, a, anybody can do it, you become an expert on the natural history of Oregon and a specialist on your ecoregion. So when I started teaching for them, I noticed, well, here's their ecoregion map. The coast, the Willamette Valley, the Cascades, the Basin and Range out here, etc. the Klamath Mountains. And it really struck me because as a geologist, look at the connections. Here's the geological provinces of Oregon, and there's almost a one-to-one -one correspondence between ecology, the, the, the life on the landscape, and the physical landscape itself. And I also do training sometimes for Oregon State Park rangers. And they do their training by the districts there. And so they showed me the districts, and look at that, the regions. It's almost exactly the same as the ecology and the geology. So administratively, it's the same thing. So in Oregon, maybe more so than any other state, we're very closely tied to our physical topography, to our, our physical landscape. So these two parallel mountain ranges, they, uh, they greatly affect the climate, commerce, and history. So for example, we know that, especially on the coast, these storms come in over seven, eight months out of the year. And you end up with a green side. But then there's the rain shadow effect as the storms lose their moisture going over the coast range and the Cascades, and there's a green side to Oregon, a brown side east. It's beautiful in its own way, of course, but it's distinctly different and it affects everything else. And Native Americans, well, sure enough, the larger population densities were in the Puget Sound, Willamette Valley area because that's where they could make a living, essentially. Things were abundant there. They could live. and then. When people came over on the Oregon Trail later, well, guess what? Most of them didn't stop in the brown side here. They went across the Cascades into the Willamette Valley Puget Sound area, where they could grow hops and make beer and plant grapes to make Pinot Noir and grow <laughs> fish. Yeah, yeah. So I think as Oregonians, we know we're really tied to the physical landscape in many ways. So let's look at these too. Why are the ranges here and why are they these uh, geological hazards? So I'll, I'll address these two in order, starting with this one. But let's look at why the, well, actually, this next slide answers both questions. OK, you've heard of fun with phonics. OK, this is going to be fun with plate tectonics. Okay? We're going to do some fun things here. If you look at where the tectonic plates are, these are the various boundaries. It's like a cracked eggshell. And there are places where they rip apart or diverge. There are places where they come together or converge. There's places where they slide past one another. Different kinds of, of mountain ranges. And if you look at where, uh, where these boundaries are and look at the mountain ranges, both above and below sea level, most of those mountain ranges are on the boundaries of the moving tectonic plate. So you can see the landscape greatly re relates to movements along these tectonic plate boundaries. And then if you look at, so this is the beauty that 
that comes about through that. But if you look at the beast, where the earthquakes and volcanic eruptions are, most of that is also at or near these tectonic plate boundaries. So look at the triangles. The red triangles, these are active volcanoes above sea level shown on this map. Just closely coincided with the tectonic boundaries. And then the earthquakes are the letters. The S's are where they're shallow. M means they're intermediate depth, and the very deep ones are D. So can you see the Pacific plate diving underneath as earthquakes get deeper and deeper? Can you see in South America, the Nazca plate dives underneath and makes deeper and deeper earthquakes? So the earthquakes <coughs> closely coincide with the activity along the tectonic boundary. So both the beauty and the beast relate to plate tectonics. So what I want to do is, um, we're actually going to do a little hands-on demonstration here, okay? We're going to go and look inside of the Earth and think about how it works. Since this is Academy of Arts, it'll be art and science. We're going to do some art and science here. So I'll talk about the whole Earth and plate tectonics. So we need to understand what goes on inside the Earth. Okay, so the Earth is round. Why, why is it round? <laughs> Very fundamental thing about the Earth, what? Gravity. Yeah, gravity. It, when, it, when it first formed, it was hot, molten state, and so suspended in space, it's going to make itself into a sphere, like pretty close to a spinning sphere. And then what happens then is that the heavy stuff is going to fall towards the inside, right? So the core is made of iron and a little bit of nickel. A lot of the heavier stuff is right in the center of the Earth. And then outside of it is lot lighter materials that we call silicates. Uh, those that are a little bit heavy, not as heavy as the core, but pretty heavy, rich in iron and magnesium, they make what's called Earth's mantle, and then the outer part of the Earth, the very thin crust, is lighter things, making rock like granite and basalt, things that are sandstone, things we're familiar with. It's towards the outside of the Earth's crust. Okay, so we've known that for more than a century now, but in the last half century, we've also come to know this, that the Earth's core, for example, it's not just a, a, a liquid core, the inside of it is solid. So not only do we know that it's made out of iron and nickel, but we know that it's in a different physical state, the center compared to that. Now, why would the outside be liquid? You know, what happens as you go deeper into the Earth? It gets heater, it gets hotter, right? So hot enough to melt this iron stuff. But yet, as you go even deeper, the same iron stuff becomes solid. Why is that? Pressure. Yeah, because the pressure also increases, so it collapses into a solid crystalline structure. We get a solid inner core. And I bring up that because look what happens on the outside. The outer shell of the Earth, the, uh, the outer 100 miles or so, which is actually the Earth's crust and the outermost mantle, it's a good hard solid. And I like to think of that as like, a stick of butter in your refrigerator. It's cold, so it's good and hard and stiff. But what happens if you take that butter and put it on your kitchen counter overnight and it warms up a bit? It may not melt, but it's gonna get softer, right? So as you go deeper, there's a layer that's a softer cell. So the, uh, the outer one we call the lithosphere. It's Greek for the hard rock sphere. A stenosphere is a softer layer underneath that a stenos is a word that means something like weak or sickly. The word asthmatic comes from that. It's a softer layer. And then you go even lower, and it becomes a good hard solid again. Now, why is that? Remember, it's warming up. But the pressure, just like here, the pressure got so great, it became a good hard solid again. So this is cool. So the outer Earth, unlike most any other planet or moon in our solar system, it's hard, soft, hard. When I look at that, guess what I see? I see an Oreo cookie. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to do an experiment. So I'll leave my junior rangers here. And I have a couple of junior. Mark, Mark's a junior ranger too, isn't he? Mark around. If you wouldn't mind, we're going to pass out some uh, scientific models here. There's Oreo cookies. There's more here to come out. So everybody get one. Here's some more. I brought plenty. I brought plenty. I brought it right here. Why don't we start passing them around over there, too? Go ahead and uh, make sure. I'll start passing these on these roads. Okay. So while we're doing that, I'm going to... 
I'm going to get my cookie out of here. Okay. All right. So while we're doing that, I want you to think about what the Oreo cookie is here in relation to the earth. So here we go. We got the hard upper cookie. That's not just the thin crust of the earth, but it's mostly the outer mantle of the earth with the thin crust. We call it, again, we, this is the hard plate, the hard lithosphere, hard rock sphere, about 100 or so miles. Away. And then below that, the creamy filling, well, that's the soft part, right? That's what we call the asthenosphere. And then the lower cookie, and by the way, you can't eat them yet because we have to be science. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you can eat it. The lower cookie is the lower, most, the lower part of the mantle. Okay, so we have hard, soft, hard. Just like you. Everybody get a cookie? Oh my gosh. Close. Okay, we have more. I'm going to need one. You want to pass this back here? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I think I brought enough. Yeah, it's coming around. Okay, so here's what you can do now. First of all, I want you to take the plate off and look at it. Look at it. Twist it. And as you're doing that, has anyone heard of the um, Oreo Psycho Personality Test? <laughs> it's from a website called superkids.com. But what it is, if you go to that site, it'll tell you that scientists have discovered that the way you eat Oreo cookies, it says a lot about your personality. And here's the ways it does that, okay? There's, we won't go through all these ways, but let's think about this one. Anybody eats it twisted apart, the inside and then the cookie? So we're twisting it apart first, right? And here's what this website says about your personality. If you eat it that way, it means uh, you have a highly curious nature. So that's good. I like that. You take pleasure in breaking things apart to find out how they work. Though you're not always able to put them together, so you destroy all the evidence. You deny your involvement when things go wrong and you're a compulsive liar and exhibit. Uh, <laughs> so, so let's do this. I can't help you with this part. You'll have to seek help elsewhere. But up here, I think this is good, right? So we're going to explore how this, take this apart and explore how it relates to the earth. So let's do that. First of all, can you slide, put the plate back on and slide it on. And as you do that, I'd like, to look, look, I'd like you to look at your fingernails and watch them grow. Okay, can you do that? Well, how long will we be here? <laughs> if, if you did that for a year without cutting your nails, how long would they be? Maybe a fraction of an inch to a two, three inches, right? Uh, th that's important because these tectonic plates, they're about 100 miles thick, but they move ever so slowly, on the average about the rate your fingernails grow. Think about that, an inch or so per year. But it's, it adds up, in about 100 million years, you can open the entire Atlantic Ocean, no problem. Okay, so that's the one thing about geology. Processes may be slow on the average, but given enough time, it's amazing. Okay, so by the way, this is my son, Ben. He's, uh, he's now a professional hand model. <laughs> Actually, uh, Mark, he's been on Mark's show, too. He has a group in New York City called Story Collider. And he just opened a nightclub in, in Manhattan called Caveat. Google that, caveat.nyc. And it's for, like, budding TED Talkers and uh, science pub type things and artists and poets and everything, every, every seven days a week. So he's doing some cool stuff. Anyway, that, that's an aside. So let's do this. And um, OK, what I'd like you to do, take the cookie, the, the, the upper cookie, and can you crack it in half? OK, and make two plates out of the one, right? Now, as you did that, did you hear that? OK, somebody tell me what that is. It's earthquakes, right? Can you do that with the creamy filling? No, because the way it behaves when you stress it and it strains and it, 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 does, it does it in a ductile fashion. It doesn't give off sound. Whereas <coughs> the cold lithosphere plate, it's, it's hard, cold, stiff, brittle. It breaks, it cracks. It's brittle behavior. And so hence we get earthquakes associated with plates, especially along their boundaries. Okay. 
So where does this happen? Where one, yes, yeah, slide one past the other. And by the way, you hear, you hear the earthquakes going as you slide it. Sticks and let's go, sticks and let's go. <laughs> yeah, someone said it already, the San Andreas Fault in California. So the Pacific Plate is moving northward past the North American Plate, and this is the San Andreas Fault in California. So that's one kind of tectonic plate boundary, and we see it here. The plates aren't ripping apart or crashing together, but one is simply sliding past the other. <coughs> and we see it here. Here's the San Andreas Fault going from the Gulf of California to Cape Mendocino, and this western sliver of California is moving in. Which brings up something interesting, because how many of you like going to Disneyland? <laughs> yeah, I mean, now you, exactly, but now you have to drive all the way on I-5 for a day and a half. And if you just wait 10 million years, you'll just drive on the ferry boat. And, and uh, yeah, it's amazing what, given enough time, what can happen. Disneyland is going to be offshore. Cool. As if we don't already have enough Californians moving here. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> My wife's from California. So I'm glad she moved here. Okay. So here we are. This sheared up landscape, these long valleys, you know, San Francisco Bay itself, it's this sheared up landscape that's there in Western California because of movement along the San Andreas Fault. So this is beauty from the beach. Yes, there's earthquakes, but that incredible beauty of Western California is, is for the same reason. Okay, where is it happening where <clears throat> plates are diverging? Can you put, put them together and pull them apart? Where is that happening? Oops, don't, break, don't do what I just did. I broke the lower cookie. <laughs> where is it happening? Yeah, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, exactly. Divergent plate boundary. So North America is moving along Africa and the plate boundary here in the Atlantic Ocean, as the Atlantic Ocean is open, that's called the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and we see it here. The plates rip apart, the hot stuff rises and starts melting, and like a hot air balloon, balloon being inflated, it lifts up a mountain range on the water, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And also, what else is happening here? What's this little island here? Iceland. Yeah, Iceland. This is the Mid-Atlantic Mid Ridge, and right on it is Iceland, and if you've ever been there, you know, this thing is happening. You can kind of see things ripping <laughs> apart there, right? And there's also volcanic activity because the hot stuff is rising and melting. And this is important because it's not just happening in the Mid-Atlantic Grid. It's happening right in our backyard. Look at this. There's an area called the Basin and Range Province right in here that includes all of Nevada and Eastern California and Southeastern Oregon where tectonic plates are ripping apart. And we get beautiful downdrop basins, <coughs> uplifted mountain ranges like the Steens Mountains in the Alabama <coughs> Desert, for example, or like the Klamath Basin. And here's an example here. Lake Tahoe is there because the lake is filling the, the Rift Valley here in uh, Eastern California and, and Western Nevada. So that's a divergent plate boundary. Okay, so we've seen where plates are ripping apart the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. I like to think of the Earth as a giant recycling machine. So plates are manufactured. You get new, through the volcanic activity and the ripping apart, you get new te tectonic plates made here. But, but what happens on the other side of South America here? See the plates coming together? Plates are converging. So I think Mother Earth is giving us a me message here. Earth, Earth is a giant recycling machine. So we know how important recycling is on the, on the scale, the curbside recycling in its communities. But the planet itself is giving us a message. It recycles. Plates are manufactured here, and then they're recycled at these areas where one plate dies beneath the other. Well, we have a name for that. When one plate dies beneath the other, we call that a subduction zone. Where's the nearest subduction zone to us? We're on it. It's called the Cascadia Subduction Zone. And by the way, what's in Western South America here? Yeah, yeah there's a volcanic mountain range just like our Cascades. That's called the, the Andes Mountains. Okay, so subduction zones, you can see the green with the little flags on them here. That's where one plate dives beneath another. Subduction zones are rimmed the Pacific Ocean 
And then here's a little one here, our own Cascadia subduction zone, where the one that you complain from offshore is diving beneath us. So here, can you do that? This is the hardest thing I'm going to ask you to do. <laughs> Push one plate beneath the other, make it stick for centuries and then let go, stick for centuries and let go, get bigger space. But that's the Cascadia subduction zone. So we have the one the FUCA plate diving beneath the North American plate. And the whole region here where that's happening is called the Cascadia subduction zone. Okay. So that's the three kinds of plate boundaries. And you can see the beauty from this beast, things like Mount Rainier in Washington State, just like the Andes volcanic mountain ranges because of that subduction. A convergent plate boundary. Okay, so we've seen where volcanoes and earthquakes coincide with uh, plate boundaries, but look at these two places. Look at Hawaii and Yellowstone. What's happening there? They're far from tectonic plate boundaries, yet you have significant earthquakes and a lot of volcanic activity. What's happening there? This we call, anybody have a sheet of paper? Just a blank sheet of paper. Yeah. I want you to think about if there's some hot material rising from the Earth's mantle. It rises and melts and makes volcanoes on the surface of the plate, right? What's going to happen if the tectonic plate is moving? See, I'm not moving this hot spot, right? I'm moving the plate. I'm going to get a chain of volcanoes on the surface, right? So let's have a look at that. Here's the big island called Hawaii, and in the Hawaiian island chain, and then some submerged seamounts, atolls and seamounts farther here. So the big island is forming today. The, the um, island of Kauai formed 5 million years ago. Midway Island here formed 21 million years ago. And way over here, this subsea atoll formed 45 million years ago. You see what's happening? The hot spot is here, but yet the plate has been moving this way, carrying the volcanoes and the islands away from the hot spot. So that's another kind of tectonic feature. But we have it in our backyard too. So here's Pacific plate. You could model it this way if you didn't break the upper cookie. You're moving the plate, Pacific plate over the hot spot, and you're going to get a line of volcanoes if that happens. So guess what? And then you get this enormous amount of volcanic activity here on the big island of Hawaii. Okay, so Yellowstone, same sort of thing, only instead of beneath the ocean, beneath the continent. So this is the Yellowstone hotspot. It would be the same sort of thing. The North American plate is kind of moving in a sort of a westerly, west-south, west direction. The Yellowstone hotspot comes up, and you're going to get a chain of volcanoes in the Pacific Northwest. It's there. I'll show you where it is. It actually starts here, surfacing 17 million years ago, as the Columbia Plateau. I'll give you details of this a little later in the talk. But then look at this chain of volcanoes, 16 million, progressively 12, 6, 2, and forming today, right at Yellowstone. So the hot spot is here, but the tectonic plate is moving this way, right? Here's the surfacing of the hot spot. Here's the plate motion. So we get the chain of giant, what we call explosive calderas, including Yellowstone. And then here, the Yellowstone supervolcano is there today, still there could go off. So we'll get into that later. So that's here in the Pacific Northwest. And we get all this beauty from the bees at the Yellowstone hotspot. <coughs> Things, all these beautiful geothermal features, hot springs, mud plots, geysers, really cool stuff. Is the similar to the mammoth? Yes, is the Yellowstone hotspot similar to mammoth? Mammoth. Uh, and Mammoth is in like southern, it's in California south of Yellowstone. It's actually on the edge of, what's, of what I, I talked about, the Basin and Range Province. You get volcanic activity there. It's on the edge of the Basin and Range Province. It's, so it's from plates ripping apart, starting to rip apart there. Yeah, okay, so here we go. So in summary, if you want to eat the cookies, no, you can't, right? <laughs> but I'm supposed to read the back of the package. I know what it says. Each cookie has. Uh, <laughs> It has uh, 70 uh, calories and one and a half grams of fat. So you're welcome to eat. <laughs> anyway, just don't eat too many in your time. So, uh, you know, we have places where plates diverge and you get earthquakes and small to, small to medium-sized earthquakes. 
and volcanoes. You get places where plates converge, and you can see you get volcanoes on the overriding plate, and you get a, a variety of earthquakes, small, medium, and, and, and large, including the very deepest earthquakes in the Earth. Where you, where you also get the biggest ones where these plates, you see these white dots here? That's where the plates lock together for centuries and suddenly let go. Uh oh, that's us. I'll be getting into that, the beast part. Okay, and then you have transformed boundaries with little or no volcanic activity, but, but some significant uh, earthquakes on the transformed boundary on the San Andreas, and then here's the hot spot. Okay. Well, let's see how this applies to the Pacific Northwest. You can see I talked about where, uh, you know, we're blessed here. How many of you are from Minnesota? <laughs> you know, you're blessed there. It's a beautiful landscape, but it's an ancient landscape. You have all three kinds of plate boundaries in the hotspot track. But it happened like two billion years ago, so you're seeing the erosional remnants of there. Still beautiful, but it's not active now. We're blessed. We have the active plate boundaries, all three boundaries. <laughs> well, you know, you got to take the beauty with the beast. You see where plates are ripping apart, the basin and range? Not only that, but look offshore where the Juan de Fuca plate is created at the Juan de Fuca and the Gorder ridges. This is just like little mid-Atlantic ridges off our shore. And then we have uh, transform boundaries, San Andreas, but not just that. Look offshore. You ever wake up and you hear about, well, there was an earthquake overnight off the coast? Guess what? Most of those are along these kinds of boundaries offshore. They're not from the subduction zone. Most of them that you hear, those the fairly common ones that are like magnitude three to five or something like that, that's where they are. Okay. And then uh, we have, of course, our convergent boundary, the one the Fuca plate diving underneath. So I'm going to focus mostly on that because that's where we are. And that's what's so important for western, <coughs> western part of the Pacific Northwest. Okay, and you can see the landscapes that develop. You see this basin and range province. Isn't that neat the way? Look at how, can you do this with your fingers? Divergent. <coughs> you know, ma make your hand wider. Don't you get mountain range and a valley? So. You get a basin and a range, a basin and a range. You get a whole bunch of that. So look at the landscape in Nevada and southeastern Oregon. That, that's what's forming it. That's stretching. And then you can see uh, here's our Cascadian subduction zone and then San Andreas transform boundary, this sheared up landscape. And then here's the Yellowstone hotspot track from the Columbia Plateau all the way to Yellowstone. So it's reflected in the beautiful landscape. Okay, so this question, why are there two parallel mountain ranges here? I think you kind of have an idea, right? But they are distinctly different ranges. Like, are the are the are are, are the Coast Range Mountains? Is Mary's Peak or Mount Olympus going going to erupt? No. Are there going to be ginormous earthquakes in the Cascades? No. But are not nearly as big as we get here. But there are certainly volcanoes there. So they're quite different <coughs> landscapes, but also different geological hazards. Okay, so let's look at that. So here's the coastal ranges and the Cascade volcanoes, and it's because of the subducting plate. So look at the extent of the plate and look at the active volcanoes. Up north here, the northern part of the one Fuca plate, there's the northernmost, most active volcano, Mount Garibaldi in British Columbia. And then way down here, Lassen Peak, you see the border plate is the southern part of the Juan de Fuca plate. And that's exactly where Lassen Peak is. So you can see the active volcanoes correspond to the active uh, subduction zone. Okay. So what forms these two different kinds of, of uh, mountain ranges? So you can see how they're quite different. Look at this. This is sandstone and shale, right? Layers of sand and mud compacted and uh, made turn into rock on the ocean floor. But what, what's wrong with this picture? 
Yeah, you know, the layers get laid down like this, but these tectonic forces have scraped them off and lifted them up and folded and folded them. And you're seeing a place here in Olympic National Park where they're, they're almost vertical. So you can see how Earth is very dynamic, <coughs> uplifting things from the ocean that were in the ocean and lifting them up, and that's the coast range. And then farther, farther east, here's the steep explosive volcanoes, these beastly uh, cascade volcanoes like Mount St. Helens. But that's much, that's 100 to 150 miles east, right? So what's happening in this overall uh, subduction zone? <coughs> okay, here's Mary's Peak from Kerbal. This is the coast range and all its glory. This is, by the way, anybody who's been up to Benton Green in Corvallis, it's just a, another beautiful place to see. In one direction, you're seeing the glory of the coast range. And on a clear day in the other direction, you're seeing the Willamette Valley and the Cascade Volcanoes. And you're seeing those whole subduction zones in there. Okay, so here's how this happens. Here's how you get the two parallel mountain ranges. So, for example, right here, you can see the one, the Fuca plate, it's going to dive down. And then there's material, there's sand and mud, and, 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 and there are volcanic lava flows, for example, that are made here at the one, the Fuca ridge. So that constitutes the ocean floor. So those layers are uh, the sediment and basalt, that's lifted up and piled up as the coastal range. And we get beautiful things like the Olympic Mountains and Mary's Peak. And then what happens farther east if you get deeper? What happens when this plate goes into the earth? What changes down there? Heat and pressure, right? So what happens to something when you heat it up and put it under pressure? What, what happens to you when you, you're, you're really working out, running, bicycling, skiing? What happens to you when you get hot and under a lot of pressure? Sweat. These rock, the plate sweats. It really does. I mean, technically, the these ocean rocks they uh, they metamorphose because of the heat and pressure. They they recrystallize to other other to different minerals, different rocks, and a byproduct is given off a lot of fluid, especially water. So the plate sweats just like us when it's under heat and pressure. So, but it has to be like a hundred miles or so deep, eighty miles in our case. It has to be that deep before that happens, so that's much farther inland, you can see. It's not beneath us. The rocks are too, too cold here. They're hotter here, and that's where the sweating is, and so hence we get the Cascade Volcanoes, the volcanic mountain range farther inland. So stuff like the Three Sisters. Okay, well what about in between Puget Sound and the Willamette Valley area? Just kind of staying there near sea level, a little below sea level here in Washington, a little above sea level in Oregon. It's just the area uh, near sea level between the two actively forming mountain ranges. <coughs> so that's our landscape, that, you know, and, and you can see it here. The Cascadia subduction zone, Coast Range, Willamette Valley, Cascade Volcano. If you go on top of Mary's Peak on a clear day, look at this, Coast Range, Willamette Valley, and there's the Cascades. Has anybody been up there when it was like this? Isn't that amazing? It's like you're on the Olympic Peninsula looking across Puget Sound at, at, the, at Mount Rainier, right? You can see how the Willamette Valley and Puget Sound are essentially the same thing. They're a little below sea level, we're a little above, but when the clouds move in, it's like it's covered with the sea. It's amazing, it's the same feature. And hence, that's why I call Mary's Peak an island in the sky. So that second book Mark was talking about. So by the way, both books, I have them there for sale um, here. And you can also get them here at Cape Perpetua, or at the Point Ahead, or at the Hatfield Marine Science Center, or Amazon, or a bunch of other places around here. Okay, but this, this is why I call Mary's Peak an island. It's truly an island in the sky for many reasons, because it's sticking way up, sometimes above the clouds, but also the ecology up there is amazing. It's so high up that it's a remnant of the ecology of the last ice age. It's, it's warmed up since the last ice age. The noble fir forest used to be really extensive in the coast range, but now there's just a little bit above 3,000 feet or so in the coast range. 
And the subalpine metal is the same thing. So this is a relic of an ice age, but it's truly an island in the sky ecologically as well. OK, the Cascade Volcanoes, why are they in such a straight line? Pretty straight line, right? From Mount McLaughlin in southern Oregon to Mary's Peak near Portland. I'm sorry, to Mount Hood near Portland. Why are they in such, such a straight line? And I want you to think about the subducting plate. It's a little animation here. OK, so the plate is diving down, and you can see the rocks be scraped off. And then metamorphosed here, and here's the sweating, the dehydration, and melting uh, rock here to make magma. And then you get the volcanoes farther inland. So again, it has to be deep enough. And so if, if, you, if, you, go, if you go skiing at Mount Hood or Mount Bachelor or cross-country skiing at McKenzie Pass, well, you know, when you're on that chairlift, you can tell the person next to you, hey, guess what? There's a sweating plate down there. <laughs> That's why these beautiful volcanoes, they're going to be really impressed, you know, especially if they're from California. So, um, no, it's, it's amazing. That plate is about, is about, actually about 50 miles, 80 kilometers underneath you. That's where this sweating process happens here in the Pacific Northwest. Okay. So the parks and the Cascades, they show, showcase where the top of the plate reaches you know, about 50 miles depth and starts to, um, starts to dehydrate. So just to show you some of them, Beauty from the Beast, uh, Mount Rainier, here's uh, Mount Jefferson, Three Sisters, Crater Lake. By the way, Anybody know what forms this valley here? It's called Sun Notch. Yeah. I want you to do something that I call the Crater Lake Handshake. So you'll have to team up with the person next to you. And I'll let you help me here, maybe, if you don't mind. So here's what you do. I'll do this. Okay, I'm going to do this. Then what I want you to do is uh, make a fist and push it through there. So have one person do this. V shape, right? And then I want you to make a fist and punch me in the nose. I mean, not literally. So now what happened? Now, now let it melt. Now what happened there? You know what happened? What makes this? No, a valley with a V shape. Water, a river valley. What makes this? You get an ice embedded with sand and grid and boulders. It carves up the rock into a new shape. There you go. Here it is. So, there it is. By the way, I stole this from park rangers at Yosemite National Park. They call it the Yosemite handshake. Have you been to Yosemite Valley? Guess what? It's from glaciers doing that. It was like that. The glaciers came through. Here. So they, they start programs that way as an icebreaker. Icebreaker. That's a good one. Ice melter. Ice melter. So here we go. So, but when you look at this, you can read the landscape. You interpret, read the landscape, and say, "Oh my gosh, there used to be a volcano here, right? Where is it? I mean, because what, where did those glaciers come from? They were way up here. They came down here, but the top of the glacial valleys, the source of the ice, is now completely blasted away. It's in Montana and New Jersey and just all over the place." <laughs> 7,800 years ago. So the top part of those glacial valleys, the top of the volcano, there's a mile of rock that's missing. You can see that when you go to Mount Shasta. Look at that. The top is still there, and sure enough, there's the U-shaped glacial valleys with active glaciers in it. 200 people over the summer Mount Shasta, actually Oh, yeah, yeah. It's still quite active volcano. Yeah, oh yeah, they're still very active volcanoes, so they're, they're going to go. We'll get to see that, enjoy that sometime. <laughs> okay. okay, so that's where the plate sweats hot water, and so we have the volcanic mountain range inland. Okay, and I, as I mentioned, the plate's about 50 miles deep out here, so how deep is it beneath us right now? I love, love to have kids. You can teach kids math. Say, look, 100 miles inland, it's 50 miles deep. 50 miles offshore, it's uh, essentially, you know, close to sea level. 
when it's going down. Well, how deep is it right here? <laughs> Less than 10 miles or so beneath us right now is the top of the one that you can play. And that's, yeah. We know it's 50 miles because one thing you can image, there's ways of like when you see seismic waves from distant earthquakes, they come through here. They tend to speed up when they go through this cold plate that's shoved down. They speed up here. They slow down where it goes through soft, slow parts like this. So this cold, rigid slab, you can image it going down. It's where the seismic waves speed up. So there's ways to image that plate going down. So it's approximately 50 miles deep. So uh, how deep is it here? That's important that it's not very deep because guess why? Where do the plates lock for centuries and suddenly let go? It's not going to be here because the plate is too, too hot and it's getting too ductile. It's warming up a bit, but it's cold enough here where they lock here and they let go as these ginormous earthquakes. Oops. From kind of a little bit offshore to about where Mary's Peak is here, that's where the plates will lock for centuries and suddenly let go. Okay, let's take a deep breath. So again, we don't need to be scared, we just need to be prepared. So knowledge is good. We know these things. We can prepare our communities for it. And we're doing a lot of great things to do that. We need to continue to do that. I mean, you could move to Kansas. I mean, yeah. I mean, the tornado's going to get you there. So no matter where you go, there's some sort of hazard. So we need to live somewhere. So we just need to be aware of the hazards and plan accordingly. Yes? Could you address the importance or not so important process of the slow slip? Oh, the slow slip? OK. Well, I won't go into detail here, but what she's saying is that, you know, the plates stick and let go, and the cycle lasts for a, a few centuries. It takes to, to lock enough to where it can't take it any. So everybody do this. Just put your hands together and then push it down, but make it stick, and then suddenly let it snap. It's going to take about three, four, five hundred years for that to happen. And you know, a big earthquake is when it suddenly lets go, and so just for four or five minutes, you get all those plate, plates grinding together. But it took three or four hundred years for it to build up to that point. What she's talking about is farther inland. There's a place as things are heating up a bit. It's not quite that simple. Sometimes it lets go ever so slowly, so it lasts about two weeks or so, where you get just seismic energy just coming off, and the, and the ground moving a little bit above it. We call this slow slip earthquakes. You don't feel them at all because it's given off actually the equivalent of like a magnitude 7 earthquake but over a two week period so it's not a sudden burst of energy, it's spread out. So it, it sort of lets go in a different way here than it does here. So I, I won't say much more but if you want more detail just Google slow slip earthquakes if you want some more technical details of that. Okay, you can do something else with Oreos here. <laughs> this is cool. I had a, some of my students worked as park rangers for the National Park Service for their thesis. They, uh, they would work for two seasons as an actual ranger in the ranger suit for two summers, given interpretive programs and everything else. And then for their thesis, they all had geology degrees to begin with, so for their thesis they would write and illustrate uh, geology interpretive manuals for their park. So, Jen Natoli worked for Redwood National and State Park, so she came up with her version of the Oreo demo. She said, okay, make the, the plate with the filling, make that the downgoing one that you could plate, and make this the, see if I can do that. Yeah, it's working, sort of. I think you'll get the idea. You make this the uh, one that you could plate with its cover of, of uh, sediments, the ocean layers, and as you push it down, look what happens. You see the coast range forming? <laughs> the stuff from manufacturing the ocean is shoved up and makes the coast range. So that's Ranger Jen's version. Of, and you see it there. You push this down and scrape stuff off, and here's the coast range. All right, let's look at that. So of course you can see how this happens then. And then, uh, so the coast range, it has layers of you know, the volcanic rock basalt from the ocean floor, and then the cover of sand and sand and mud, sandstone shale, those layers are scraped up and pushed off, as you saw in the last diagram. 
And the landscapes, here's Olympic National Park again. So as we go down the coast, we see the beauty of that beastly thing. Because again, every time it lets go in a big way, that's a giant earthquake, but it lifts up things a fraction of an inch to an inch or two every time that happens. So over a long time, you're going to get landscapes like this. It's lifted and also simultaneously eroded. Here's a, where am I? Yeah. Okay, here's Cape Perpetua, just a couple of miles from here. Here's uh, Oregon Islands National Seashore as you go farther south, and Cape Blanco State Park, and then uh, Redwood National and State Parks in California. Ah, here's Corvallis. Who's been there? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I like Corvallis. So here's some of my some important uh, places in Corvallis. Here's the Oregon State University, of course. And here's the campus beanery in downtown New York. <laughs> so what's this right here? here By the way, did you know that it used to be called Mouse Mountain? Yep. And I think it's even more appropriate now because with computer mouses, you get the idea? <laughs> it's Mouse Mountain. I like that. So that's Mary's Peak. 4,097 feet, the highest point in the Oregon coast range. And this is actually, I live near here. I'll, Highway 34, the switchbacks as you go between Philomath and LC over LC side. I live just a quarter mile from this picture. You can see, just like Olympic, those layers of sandstone and shale lifted out of the ocean right here on Highway 34. What are these things? By the way, that's my son Ben, who is a, a little guy. <laughs> yeah, they're called basalt, they're basalt lava flows, they're called pillows. They were manufactured in the ocean about 55 million years ago and lifted out. And that's part of the reason Mary's Peak is so high. So here's how they form, though. Here's why they can be, they're really important. Just a very fundamental thing they say about how these lava flows form. Because to get pillows, I'll show you how you do that. Watch this. Now, this is underwater photography, technically from Hawaii. But it's lava as it flows into the ocean. And you see the pillows forming? Well, if on land, they're going to spread out for miles and make thin layers, but when it hits that cold water, it makes these pillows and they pile on top of one another. So this is really cool because when you see pillow basalts, you say, oh, it's water. And almost always it means this one in the ocean. Now, this guy doing this, I wouldn't recommend this. Watch over here in the corner. This scuba diver. Oh my god. That's like 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, just a lot. So I would, oops, I guess he's doing it for science. Okay, so <laughs> there you go. You see the lava flowing out of the ocean floor, and it makes pillows that pile on top of one another and fill the gaps so they become like footballs or watermelon sized pillows. And here we are. <coughs> It's called pillow basalt. Now, there's one notable exception in Oregon in pillows form in the ocean. Do you know where that is? This is cool. Rock. You know, rock is unusual. That's yeah. Basalt, yeah, but it did flow into water, presumably into ocean water. You can see pillows. <laughs> but when they did uh, dives in Crater Lake in the 1980s in the little submarine, guess what they found uh, at the base of Wizard Island? They found pillows. So it shows that even as Wizard Island was still erupting, there was enough water, you know, significant water in Crater Lake. And so you get pillows. But almost always it means you're in the ocean when you see pillows. So here you go. Here's how this happens. And here's how this is going to relate to earthquakes now. And tell me if you can hear this. Okay. In this subduction zone, the thinner yet denser oceanic plate dies beneath the continental plate. The continental plate is locked to the subducting plate by immense friction along the shallow portion of a vast sloping fault surface. GPS data for many subduction zones show that the friction indeed causes the leading edge of the overlying plate to be forced backwards. During subduction, the thin layer on top of the oceanic plate is scraped off and forms a wedge at the front of the continental plate. The continental plate deforms in response to the stress. Plates can lock for hundreds of years until frictional stress is overcome in a process called elastic rebound. This can produce magnitude 8 and magnitude 9 great earthquakes. 
Tsunamis occur when the ground beneath the ocean is displaced, as it does in the simplified animation. This cycle of locking and building stress, followed by catastrophic release, repeats every few hundred years. Okay, so why are there earthquakes and, and tsunamis here in the Pacific Northwest? Let's look at that. Was anybody around when this happened? <laughs> Do you remember? Yeah, my wife and I heard about that. But, and we went a couple of days later. This is the Quinnahead in the back. This is Agate Beach, a state park site just north of Newport. And this strange thing washed on shore one morning. And there was a plate on it. It's noticed it came from Mishawa, Japan, on the island of Honshu. And this was brought to Japanese consul in uh, Portland, and they they verified it. Yeah, this is a part of a dock that was dislodged during a giant earthquake on uh, Mar in uh, March of 2011, a, little, a year and a half before, floated all the way across the Pacific Ocean, and here it is. So we went there, and like you know, normally you get a few hundred people, two three hundred people at this place on a weekend day in June, but there were like ten thousand every day showing up. Because this was unusual and incredibly interesting. So we see people taking pictures of their friends, right? You know, we used to stereotype Japanese people and say, well, okay, they go around the world taking pictures of, of their friends. But, but guess what? That's, that's a very human thing. We all do it. So here's Americans taking pictures of a Japanese doc, right? So, so you know, being an interpreter, my wife and I, we, well, we went there. And we, we wanted to see how the people were interacting with this thing. So we're taking pictures of the people interacting. And this one guy, we're wondering, what's he taking a picture of? And it's the word Japan written in English on this dock. And so this is a very much a sense of place thing. The fact that this thing came from Japan, and we know its story, is like, wow, this is very powerful. And it speaks to us. Because we're a mirror image of the Japan subduction zone. So here's the deal. We get Japan subduction zone, the Pacific plate is diving towards the, the west underneath uh, Europe, Eur Eurasia. Our little subduction zone, the Juan Fuca plate, is diving to the east underneath <coughs> North America. So we're a mirror image like this, Japan, Oregon. So guess what? You know, I mean, there's great beauty in Japan, we know, from beautiful landscape, mountains, volcanoes like Mount Fuji, but guess what? It's a, they also have beasts like we have. And so they're sending us a message, aren't they? Because Japan and Oregon, they're linked by similar coastal hazards, earthquakes and tsunamis. So March 11th, 2011, the last big Japan earthquake, you know, magnitude nine, and accompanying tsunami. Our last one was January 26, 1700. Okay. So this is a postcard from Japan, right? Saying, hey guys, you know. <laughs> We need to be prepared. So here's the former mayor of Newport and the Consul General of Japan. Um, a year later, actually two years to the date of the earthquake and tsunami in Japan, this, the piece of the, this dock was put there at the Hatfield Marine Science Center with interpreting exhibits. Okay, so these big ones occur when the plates lock for centuries and suddenly let go. But this is where they stick and let go. And this is on right here. And the worst case scenario is if the plates are stuck between Northern California and Vancouver Island, stuck for several centuries, and then suddenly let go. If it's all at once, that's a magnitude nine earthquake. If a piece of that breaks, that might be a magnitude eight, which is still pretty significant. So we need to be ready for all of this. So the big ones happen every 200 to 600 years. The last one was in the year 1700, 318 years ago, next January, next week, January 26th. OK, so what's this? <laughs> yeah, this is from the Copalis River in Washington State. It, but it's. It's some trees, but it's also part of a detective story. And it's the work of the beast. Let's see how. 
This is Brian Atwater from the U.S. Geological <coughs> Survey. He's a kayaking freak. He loves kayaking, but he's an amazing scientist. And for decades, he's been studying these trees and other aspects of estuaries on the coast. And he noted, for example, that these drowned forests, if you do carbon dating, you can see that, well, they died about 300 years ago, plus or minus 30 years. So you can kind of narrow it down. And in this guy, David Yamaguchi, he's a dendrochronologist. He studies tree rings. And there are trees that didn't quite die during this event. They survived it, but they were inundated by some seawater, not enough to kill them like the trees I just shared. So those witness trees, they show normal growth right through the fall of 1699, and in stunted growth for several decades after that, when they were a little bit in the intertidal zone getting too much salt. So that tells you that the Earth, so let's review this. So the carbon dating says the trees died about 300 years ago, but a wide range there. Gets you within 50 years or so. The tree range studies say it was between 1699 and 1700. You can get like a six month window for when this big event happened that killed those trees. So how can I can tell you with confidence that it was on January 26, 1700 when that last big earthquake and tsunami happened at 9 p.m. <laughs> How can I possibly say that? This is so cool because now we need a, the people history is important. Anthropology, history. Brian Atwater has also became fluent in Japan in the Japanese, so he could work there for several years. And you know, one winter's night, the year 1700, a mysterious tsunami flooded fields and washed away houses in Japan. It arrived without the warning that a nearby earthquake usually provides. Samurai merchants and villagers recorded the event, but nearly three centuries would pass before discoveries in North America revealed the tsunami source. And here's the source. So you see the big earthquake making a tsunami in the Pacific Northwest, and the records from the uh, Japan, the harbor records show it's sweeping across Japan at certain times. And the, the uh, harbor master, tsunami means harbor wave, and the harbor masters are very important. They kept very detailed records like these. Anybody read Japanese? <laughs> well, Brian has interpreted some stuff here. But um, these are supposedly accurate within uh, plus or minus uh, two hours. You know, from the time hints on these and things, but it shows about, especially this thing came without warning. Like most earthquakes there, like in 2011, there's enormous shaking and then the tsunami comes. But occasionally there's a tsunami without the shaking before. So it's called an orphan tsunami. It doesn't have the earthquake there locally. It came from elsewhere around the Pacific Rim. But I think it's pretty clear this one came from the Pacific Northwest, that last big one that we had. So that's. It's amazing the scientific and <coughs> historical anthropological evidence that's all put together. And add to that Native American stories that you can't really tie down dates or years that well, but boy, it's pretty clear there were a series of these events generations apart. Okay, so here's how this happens. You see the plates sticking for centuries, subducting plate diving down, drag down, stuck. Notice how part of it's going to lift up, and you can even develop a marsh and a forest that just bulges up. You can get a forest developing here, but then as the earthquake happens, suddenly lets go, it's going to lift the seafloor. So when you did your little thing like this, when you let go, go ahead and do this. Push it down. As you let go, notice something's going to bulge up, and offshore it's going to bulge down. But when you let it go, some of it will drop down, but offshore it's going to pop up. It's that popping up offshore. I'll run this one more time. The popping up offshore will lift the seafloor, lift the water column. It's going to spread out as a series of tsunami waves, lasting several, several hours. Okay, here we go. You'll see this pop up. And boom, there's the tsunami here and to Japan. And drownings, what were trees? Trees are now in the intertidal zone, and so saltwater will kill, kill them. Here's an example. In 2004, a big uh, earthquake and tsunami in, in, in Indonesia. Here's a before aerial photograph. 
You can see roads and houses and trees, but unfortunately afterwards, it's not just the shaking and the water from the tsunami, it's the fact that a whole area dropped down like five, six, seven feet. It dropped down, and so here's the after. So that's why you know these tsunami warning signs are very important. It's more than just what your elevation is now. You might, in some areas, you have to realize that the whole area will also drop down a few feet. So we need to take all that seriously about where we build in the future and how we build. And if you go to state parks and other sites on the coast, you can see uh, some of these ghost uh, stumps. Some of them are from the 1700 <coughs> earthquake, but others have been carbon dated. They're from even older events. And we can see a sequence of events over several thousand years. And we can do it this way, too. Here's a. This is from the Neowaka River in southwest Washington. You see this gray layer? That is the sand from the 1700 tsunami. There's been deposits on top of it. So it dropped down into the bay and estuary. It's built up. And it's now uh, bulging up above sea level. And there's a marsh and forest there. And when you look at, um, if you cut deeper, you can see there's some older tsunami sands at times. and there's down drop bay mud, and then on top of that is a younger tsunami sand, and then here's the modern day mud and, uh, and marsh. So there's a whole bunch of these over 10,000 years or so. So that's why we can see about every two to 600 years there's a, a major event causing an earthquake, tsunami, tsunami <coughs> sand, the down dropping. And we come up with a record of what's happened. Okay, so it happens in the Pacific Northwest every 200 to 600 years. The last big one was in January 1700. This is cool. This was developed by OSU Extension, this little sign. And it's all over the world now, this tsunami warning signs. It's really cool. So here's, a, here's what it says often. It's, you know, when you see this, get to high ground. Now, nearby, a distant earthquake, like from Alaska, you'll have like four or five hours for the tsunami, and as you know from Japan or South America, it's more like 10 to 15 hours that you have before the first waves get there. But uh, a local one, it's more like 20 minutes. Okay, the Cascadia subduction zone letting go, you're only talking about like 50 miles offshore. It only takes maybe 20 minutes to get here. So, you see signs like this. Oh, <laughs> so I like to say, I, I reworded this. I mean, sometimes we, we have tsunami sirens, but the earthquake itself can be the warning. So if you hear a tsunami warning siren or the shaking of an earthquake, I mean, don't wait for your cell phone to tell you. I mean, just get to higher ground. So another way of putting it is when you hear a loud shrill, get your ass to get up. Is the way you get to the right? The shrill being the siren or the shaking of the earthquake itself. Do that and ask questions later about it. Maybe so. Okay. All right. I love this sign. This is from Pat Corcoran, Old Street Center. This is in Seaside, Oregon. What are you going to do? Now, he, he explained this later. It's one of those roads that it's one way in one direction, but it's two ways this way, okay? One of those, and you know what I'm talking about. So it's not as bad as it seems. So the research shows uh, ginormous earthquakes once every uh, 200 to 600 years. The last one was in 1700. So we know we need to be prepared. And we are. And I, I love this because this was a sign that just in the last couple of years, these signs have appeared in uh, Yahats, and I love it. This is the first communities where this was done. It says, in case uh, entering a tsunami ready community. So I like that sense of empowerment, you know, that we can use this knowledge in a positive way for, for public safety that speaks to community and sense of place. So notice as you're coming into town, this is the sign that's there. And I, I liked it so much, it's on the back of that book, Beauty from the Beast book. This is the back cover right there. And look what, look, you see what the photograph is there. From the lookout at Cape Perpetua, and out. That's, uh, that's Cape Perpetua right here on the back cover. Okay, so I'm gonna yes. How high a tsunami can you expect from a 9.3 quake? How high a tsunami? Okay, you know it depends. I mean, nominally, 
the tsunami itself, you know, just naturally could be like a 10 to 30 foot wave. And not just one wave, it's a series of waves. And incredibly broad though. So between the cresting of the wave and the water being sucked out and the next crest, that might be like 45 minutes to an hour on that cycle. And furthermore, it may not be the crest that comes first, it might be the trough. So if you see the water suddenly disappearing when you're out on the beach, don't go out to collect the flopping fish and the pretty shells because that's a huge mass of water and it's coming back just a few minutes later. People in Indonesia made that mistake and hundreds of people died because of that. It's gonna come back with a vengeance. Now, I say nominally 10 to 30 feet because it depends on the, the slope of the land, the shape of the coastlines, it can be constructively reinforced in places to where you can get it growing to 100 feet in places depending on the direction it's coming from and the landscape. That's why you probably want to try to get at least 100 feet above sea level if you can, certainly at least 50. Yeah? I was just going to say, I'm from Florida. Yeah. We were 50 feet above sea level. And the town has designated our safe spot as 35 feet above sea level. And what? The town has designated our safe spot. Yeah, and for almost, for most, for 90, I, I don't want to hazard a number, but let's just say 90% of events, you're going to be fine there. But there's that rare occasional thing where you get this weird focusing where it might be bigger, so. Yeah. Wherever you are, get higher if you can. Yeah. Okay, so. Let's skip on a little bit. Pardon? So let's do this. I want to finish off with, you know, we have this beauty from the beast thing here where we have these different kinds of uh, landscapes from different kinds of fleet boundaries and a hotspot track. But we have these older mountain ranges, the Klamath Mountains, the Ochico Strawberries. This is sort of the backbone of Oregon. And these younger landscapes from the plate, from the current plate tectonic activity, that's superimposed on these older landscapes. So let's just look about what this says about how we built the continent and how we can see evidence of that on the coast. This map, let me just slow down here and show you what these numbers are. This two point this this means these very old rocks here. These are rocks when you strip away the younger sedimentary layers. This is the igneous and metamorphic rocks underneath. They're about 2.5 billion years old here, then 1.8 billion, 0.6 billion. What's the pattern here of the continent? It's, old. it's older in the center and it gets younger outward. It's being built from an old nucleosin. So what's happening? <coughs> Things are crashing in. We can see that in the Northwest. So 200 million years ago, here's the, the coast of Idaho. Right? This is, there's no Oregon wash, this is all Pacific Ocean. 200 million years ago, here's the coastline roughly. And all this has been added since then, the last 200 million years. So we call these things being added progressively terrain accretion, terrains of rocks and landscape, all being just slammed in. And it happens like this. Here's an edge of the continent, and we see our coast range and volcanoes. Subduction, but what happens if there's a thick fragment of a continent like India or Baja Peninsula or volcanic islands like Hawaii? What happens if they come crashing in? It's gonna clog this subduction zone, right? And add something to the edge, and then subduction will start up out here. So I like to call this Safeway Tectonics, okay? <laughs> so here we go. When you go to Safeway, or Fred Meyer, wherever you shop, notice this is a tectonic conveyor belt, okay? <laughs> this would be like the North American plate. Here's the ocean plate, the Pacific, or the one that you get. And as you turn this thing on, you'll see these terrains progressively crash in, right? So next time you're at Safeway, line them up and say, excuse me, I have to do a scientific experiment. And here it is. Look at this. Terrain accretions, isn't that cool? <laughs> Let me back that up. 
we just built the edge of North America for the last 200 million years as various terrains crash and do subduction, right? Here it is, the current one, but all back here is earlier stuff that got built. Okay, so I'm going to finish with a series of maps here. Almost 200 million years ago, I put Virginia here so you could kind of get a clue. Here's where Africa... Africa, Africa and South America, what's known as Gondwana land, it just crashed in, made the Appalachian Mountains, and it's starting to rip apart and open up the uh, Atlantic Ocean and the Gulf of Mexico, right? But what about the West? Where's Oregon? It's right here. It's not there. Washington, Alaska. Okay, so that's our reference. So let's see what happens as we get the clock moving. <coughs> And you see these terrains are going to crash in, and they're going to build the Pacific Northwest and Alaska over time. So let's do it. 180 million, you see the terrain? So we're gradually going to build the western edge of North America as things crash in, subduction occurs. Throw in an ice age or two for good measure. And here we are. We built the Pacific Northwest over time. So when you look at that landscape, in Cape Perpetual or wherever up here. Think about just how dynamic it is. You're only seeing a little glimpse in time. This is how it looks now. But it took vast amounts of time to build up, and it's still happening now. It hasn't stopped. It continues to be dynamic. So you can see various things crashed in, and here's, again, a schematic, where, roughly where the coastline was 200 million years ago. All of this has been added, and, and here's our current subduction zone, our Cascadia subduction zone. Yep? Earthquakes in, in between the Berta Plate and yeah. the transformation zone? Yeah. There. Does that increase the pressure on the Wadapuka? No, I think about it. This system of, this is the relative motion of the Wadapuka and the Pacific Plates. It's pulling apart here and sliding by one another here. But that's independent of the fact that the Wadapuka Plate is diving underneath at this angle. Is diving underneath North America. Yeah. Okay, so here we go. Yeah, one last little diagram, then I have a special treat for you at the end. I love this is from Tanya Atwater from the University of California at Santa Barbara. I'll run it a couple of times. I love the way she subducts the words too, right? <laughs> so let me play it again. This will be the evolution of the Western North America over the last 40 million years. Okay, so you see there was a big thing called the Farallon Plate that was diving down, but it's now segmented into the Juan de Fuca Plate here and the Cocos Plate here in Mexico and Central America, and now the Pacific Plate is moving past North America and as the San Andreas Fault here. So that's only evolved in the last 20 million years. And as you watch this, I want you to watch Nevada and see what happens, because as it starts, I call it skinny Nevada, you see it there? <laughs> What's gonna happen is that back there, that's gonna, that's the base of the range province opening up, right? And you see we have this big Farallon plate, and now it's continuous. So you have volcanoes all the way from Alaska to through to Central America. It was all volcanoes. Right now we just have the remnants of that in California because the volcanoes are eroded away, and we're seeing the granite magma chambers that were under those, and we call that the High Sierras, you know, Yosemite. Okay? And so you'll see as the plates touch, then we're going to start the Juan de Fuca plate, the, uh, start the uh, San Andreas transform boundary. It's not here yet. It's all subduction until 20 million. Then you see the San Andreas grow bigger and bigger, and this Farallon plate will make the, get smaller and smaller as the Juan de Fuca plate here and the Cocos plate down here. Okay, so a lot to look at for that. And you can go online to Tanya Atwater, to see UC Santa Barbara, Tanya Atwater, and you can download this and hundreds of others of her beautiful uh, animations for free. So here we go. I'll play it one more time. You can see how we've evolved. But I just want to impress upon you that we're still evolving, and the San Andreas Fault is getting longer. The one that Fuca Place is getting smaller. So. 20 million years, we're all going to be California. Right? We're all going to be in the San Andreas, one big happy family. And we can go to Disneyland offshore from, from the islands. Okay. So, 
So the greater Pacific Northwest, it has all three kinds of plate boundaries, as well as a hotspot track. And it's happening now. So we see a dynamic landscape as it's happening. So we live with this beauty from the beast uh, uh, landscape here. And, and you can see, as I pointed out, much of this, this pattern of plate boundaries and hotspots. You see it reflected in the overall landscape. So I made a, I got a special musical presentation. I call it the landscapes of the Pacific Northwest from a distance. And as I do this, I'm going to show photos. And in the lower right hand corner, there's going to be some Oregon State Park sites identified. So you'll see this symbol in the corner. There's going to be Washington State Parks and National Park Service, US Forest Service the Bureau of Land Management, BLM, and the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Okay, so I call it, you want to put the lights down a little bit more? Okay, it's going to be, yeah, the landscapes, yeah, that's good, landscapes of the Pacific Northwest from a distance.
Mark, we do have a few minutes if anyone has any questions, comments, or jokes or anything else. Let's start here in the front and we'll get you in the back. Oh, Yellowstone. You know. Okay. I'm going to do it in two minutes if that's all. Because I skipped, you know, I wanted to make sure I didn't go over time. So I skipped that part, but I'll, I'll give you the gist of this. Yellowstone, Yellowstone, you know, we talked about it being, you know, far from the boundaries, active plate boundaries if there's earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. You want to put the lights on just slightly? In the back? Okay, that's all right. Can you see this? The plate is moving over the hot spot and we're going to get a chain of volcanoes. And you can see it here. Columbia Plateau where it rises and then getting older and older. I'm sorry, getting younger and younger towards Yellowstone. So the plate has been moving over the hot spot that's located there. So here's how it works. I like I use a lava lamp for that, okay? Do you have a lava lamp? So go get your lava lamp. It's in the it's in the you know, your closet where you have your hookahs and bongs and all that lamps and all that stuff. And your legal cannabis is now there too. So from the sixties. You turn this thing on, you know, the, the wax is hot, I'm sorry, the wax is cold so it's more dense, denser than the oil. When you turn it on, the wax heats up and expands and it's less dense than the oil so it's going to rise. And as it rises, you see it can make these mushroom shapes, a head and a stem. So think about the hot spot in the earth, the stuff is rising. You get a head and a stem. Here's the plate riding over it. So when it surfaces, that's the massive basalt outflows of the Columbia Plateau in Oregon and Washington. And then that little stem is what's left, making those explosive volcanoes, calderas, that go all the way to Yellowstone across southern Idaho. So that's where we are today with the, the massive plume head and the stem making these explosive calderas right to Yellowstone. So that's the problem. So here we are. Here's Yellowstone. Here's the magma coming up, the plates moving over it. And you can see the size of this thing. It's amazing. Here's Yellowstone National Park. Here's the Yellowstone Caldera, 40 miles across. And for comparison, here's Crater Lake, only five miles across, and Mount St. Helens, one mile. So this was truly amazingly huge uh, when it went off about 640,000 years ago, last time in a big way. And so now we get, yeah. Now we get these beautiful geothermal things because that there's still hot magma under there. And now we get the hot springs and we get all this beauty from the deeps. Well, do you have that map? Yeah. Is Devil's Tower part of that chain? Uh, I don't know how Devil, Devil's Tower is much, much farther east, almost in eastern uh, Wyoming. I don't know exactly how it relates to Yellowstone. Okay. But here's how we relate because you see the lava from the initial service Surfacing is right here, all the way to the Willamette Valley and the Oregon coast. The lava flowed three to four hundred miles from its source here, all the way here. That was like, you know, fifteen million years ago or so. So Yellowstone, here's John Day fossil beds, here's Multnomah Falls, here's Silver Falls, Yaquina Head, and you can see the lava flows. Here's the fossil bearing layers of John Day, but here's the Columbia Plateau basalt. You see the salt columns from that. So this is ancient Yellowstone, right? The initial surfacing of this. And here's Multnomah Falls is Columbia Plateau basalt, <coughs> Silver Falls, all the way. So some of these headlands, especially the central and north Oregon coast, it's strong Columbia Plateau basalt that actually flowed three to 400 miles to the ocean. And here it is, Cape Lookout, Cape Mears, even the farther south here is, right here at Seal Rock State Park near here, is the farther south. So just north of the, you've got some Columbia Plateau of the salt, about 15 million years old. So that's another part of the story, even here on the coast. And I like to show park rangers this with the state parks because if you look at some of the state park sites, you, it's almost see the flow of the lava from eastern Oregon all the way to the coast through, by looking at the, the Columbia Plateau basalt in state parks, yeah. So does that kind of, oh, yeah, that's great. I skipped that part, I wanted, <laughs> but since you asked, I wanted to throw it in. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. So in um, Elephant Rock and Seal Rock, I was always under the impression that was part of basalt uplift that created the vertical striations, but it's not existing. 
Um, well, it has been uplifted too. I mean, a lot of that flowed into the ocean itself, and then it's all been lifted up, you know, and then stuff eroded around it. Stuff like uh, Cape Lookout's amazing because it was like a two mile long valley going to the ocean that the lava flow flowed through, the basalt lava. But then as the area uplifted and you erode down, the softer sedimentary layers eroded away. So now you have a knife edge ridge two miles long, just a great hike at Cape Lookout, just south of uh, Tullamore. Yeah, quite, is yeah. Is any of the basalt that's come in, I've been told that this is saying different. Is any of the basalt that's come in, has it come in on the plate from the basalt? Yeah, okay, she asked a good question about the age of the basalt. Was it all, some of it came as far as, you know, Cape Disappointment in Washington State, all the way down to Seal Rock um, in Oregon. Those headlands of basalt are mostly from Columbia Plateau basalt. But farther out down here, that's not the case. I mean, some of the basalt, like you see on Mary's Peak or at Tillamook, that's much older. Instead of 15 million years, that's 55 million years. That was manufactured way out in the ocean, came in with the tectonic conveyor belt, and then lifted up. So that's 55 million. Now then, you get a special case with Yahats, right here, the Yahats basalt is right outside, right on the beach here and at Cape Perpetua. That's, and at Hasita Head, that's only 30 to 35 million years old. So it's a different thing too. It probably was when the Juan de Fuca plate, for some reason when it first started to die down, it made some basaltic lava come out here near the coast. Okay? And so that's only about 35 million years old. So it's, it's, it's a different, so there are different ages of basalts here. So I don't want to make it too simple, but I mean, you can distinguish some 15 million Columbia Plateau basalt. Some of it is that really old stuff from the deep ocean floor that lifted up like Mary's Peak. But some of it is in between age where the plate initially started down and for some reason it made a little bit of uh, basalt lava that makes Cape Perpetua and Hasita Head. Yeah, okay. I explained that in the Mary's Peak book too, it's more detail. Yeah. Um, I read recently that the melting glaciers and uh, ice cap is deflecting the seafloor. Ah, melting glaciers and, okay, so it's question, okay, your comment was you read somewhere where the melting uh, um, ice cap is deflecting the seafloor. Yeah, good yeah, point. And so is that uh, going to have any impact on plate tectonics? Or well, yeah, okay. You said, well, it may have an impact on plate tectonics. Well, certainly melting ice. Well, ice, first of all, let's start with weight of ice. It depresses things, as you might expect. Because these things, rock isn't completely rigid. It, it's somewhat flexible. And so you put a mat, you know, two miles of ice on top, it's going to depress things. It's going to warp down in places and bulge up in other places, right? You put weight on it. And then so conversely, as you melt that ice, it's going to rebound upward in places and places where it bulged up, it's going to go down. So like that will affect some coastal areas as you change the weight of the ice that's there. So this, you know, melting of ice sheets, it's, there are a lot of things that are happening in addition to filling the ocean with more water and with more uh, water that's less saline, you also get tectonic movements, you know, up and down because uh, you're changing that weight distribution of, that's loading the continents. So. Do we understand anything about Oh, yeah, no, no. I mean, there's a lot of studies that, you know, yeah, understand how the weight of the ice has changed things, and then consequently, when you melt the ice, I mean, you can, we, we have melting ice now, so we can see these things reversing. And then you can model it and say, well, what happens if much, much more, all the ice melts, to get an idea of how the land surface will, will change accordingly. Yeah. If you've oh, got, yeah. If you have more questions, Dr. Yeah. Cooley, you're going to stay around. I'll stick around. And, you want to get one? Okay. Yeah, yeah if we could. Yeah. And, and a lot yeah. of these questions are answered in here because I've read them. I've read these <laughs> books, and, and I, I can't recommend them enough. So you'll get a lot of answers. Really want to thank you all for your attention and your interest. Isn't Dr. Lilly amazing? <laughs> Yeah.